All right, good morning, everybody. Let's see if we have a few people. Yeah, we got a few people. Um, so uh, I will go ahead and get started. I didn't quite finish what I wanted to do, but I'll just go ahead and do it with you right now, just so you understand. Um, trying to give you guys uh, everything you need to succeed uh, for the final exam. Good morning. Which way did the cow take to jump over the moon? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Wait a second. After his first meal on the moon, the 22nd century astronaut said the food was good, but the place lacked atmosphere. Ba -da -ba. And Anna, which way did the cow take to jump over the moon? The Milky Way. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. Thank you, guys. That was wonderful. Oh, my gosh. Okay. So let's just switch to this. So I can say good morning, everybody. Wow. So um, anybody, uh, how did you feel about taking the test online? Was it was it really difficult or did you feel okay? I mean, it looks um, as though the class average is uh, significantly higher than usual. So I take that as a positive sign. Uh, did anybody find it really hard to take it online versus a paper test? Anybody want to contribute there? Um, any feelings? You don't have to, by the way, I just, uh, just asking, just curious. Um, but I do wanna, you know, help you guys get ready for the, the final. And the final, of course, has to be online as well. So, you know, we're gonna do the best that we can. Um, but anyways, really fun material to, to cover for the last part of the course. And some of the amazing little, you didn't like taking it. Okay, thank you, Anna. I didn't like giving it. <laughs> Shoot, I don't know, uh, what are the alternatives, but, um, you know, you guys uh, as a whole did very well. And I, I know that you're gonna do fine for the final. So we're gonna make it through, you didn't like it either. Okay, um, I wish there was an alternative. What is an alternative? I don't know what it is. So if you could think of one, let me know. I could interview everybody. That's my dream, right? I interview everybody. I give everybody like a 15 minute interview and I'll ask you questions about astronomy we can chat. And then I can understand, I could grade you based on how well you, you're able to answer my questions in the interview. What do you think? You like that? You like that idea? <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, okay. So um, back to uh, the story. So let's see. I do have to just quickly do something. So let's just go and take a look at what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to our website, our, our Canvas, and... Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, show you something. Okay, so let's see. We're going to our canvas. And I want to do something that I've never done before. This is a little bit hard for me, just so you understand. Um, I've never done this before. And I'm about to do something. And what am I going to do? I am going to do it. Okay, so I have not done this quite yet. So I'm going to go ahead and I had this idea that I would give you. Um, well, first of all, normally at this time, um, you would have access to the previous three exams, okay? exam one, exam two, exam three. And some of you would spend hours in the office with me or with, with um, Libby, and you would be looking over your exam. I know this because every semester there are dedicated students who are in there uh, until they have covered every single exam and they've looked over every single question. Okay. Uh, and we don't have access to that. That is just not available. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, what can I do? <clears throat> what's a fair, uh, you know, what's a fair thing to do? Your ECE teacher, how many students are in there in the ECE class, Anna? I'm just curious, because if you only have a few students, that's okay. But otherwise, um, to do, I have unfortunately 250 Earth 101 students, so. That's not going to work for me. I want to. I would love to do that. But anyways, uh, so what's the alternative? So the answer is the best way to study. Listen, the best way to study is to review the questions from the previous exams. Unfortunately, with the current situation, I'm, I'm unable to allow you to see your previous exams. So I have decided to give you copies of the previous exams. Okay, I haven't done this yet. Uh, I will do that uh, after the, the class. But here you go, just so you have awareness here. If you click on um, the files, you now have a new folder called exams. And you can actually see, I've never done this. Oh my God, this feels like cheating. Okay, oops, what did I just do? Okay, but it's not cheating, I'm just helping you. Okay, so there are the exams now. And um, 
There's a study guide, of course, you should look over the study guide. Um, but the way it works is, I'll, I'll show you in just a moment, is there's 100 questions, just a little bit longer than a regular exam. Uh, 60 of the questions are from the old exams, 20 from one, 20 from two, 20 from three. Now keep in mind, I may be able to give everybody a different test. Wow, except I don't do that actually. What I do is I have a selected group of questions, but I could still end up giving everybody a slightly different test. So you don't, uh, you, you wanna make sure that you really try to understand uh, the questions that you might've gotten wrong on exam one, exam two, exam three and then be ready. 60% of the test is based on these old questions, okay? So I will provide you with practice quizzes um, later today. And you, I decided I wanted to make them variable uh, length. So you, you know, you're gonna go crazy. You could try to do 20 of them. Uh, I don't know why it's for you, just because it's in between 20 and 75, I guess. So you can try 20, which is the number that I'm gonna pick from that exam. Uh, you can try 40 or you can do the whole thing and make sure you really know all of them, okay? So, um, and then here are the full exams with the answers at the end, okay? So again, I've never given that to students before. Feels a little bit weird. Um, now I do have to figure out what to do. We are supposed to, we are scheduled to take our exam. If you're in the 8 a.m. class, you're scheduled to take it on Thursday at the 7th. Now, I, I'm tempted to ask everyone to take it. So how many people in the 935 class would be okay with just taking it on Thursday, the 7th? Otherwise you have to take it on Tuesday, the 5th. Okay, I don't know what the benefit would be, but does anybody in the 935 class want to take, um, do you wanna take the, uh, the exam? on Tuesday the 5th rather than Thursday the 7th. And if you do, then I have to give that to you. But I'm allowed to schedule it for later in the semester. Uh, so that's an allowed. And I'd rather uh, that everyone take it on a single day if you understand uh, why I might wanna do that. Uh, so anybody, uh, if, you, if you please voice your concern, if you have any right here, because uh, right at this moment, I'm thinking that would be the fairest thing to do that way. Um, on that day, everybody will have an opportunity uh, to take the exam and it's later than the originally scheduled date. Um, so, you know, that just seems, seems fair to me. Um, any, any complaints, anybody um, wanna argue that that's not fair? Cause that would be okay, you know, just uh, let me know. Actually, I suppose I could even give that, no, that's not gonna be good. I don't wanna do that. So uh, that's what my plan is. Everybody will take it on the 7th. I'm just, I just changed the date, okay? So if that's okay with you guys, everyone will take it on the same day. Uh, so I'm just, uh, give me two more seconds here. I'm just moving. I wanna um, make sure that everybody has access to all of this. So I'm just copying over and I will be with you in just one second, okay. There we go. Okay, the study guide is not here. Okay, so here are the exams. Exams, oh my gosh, this feels weird. One, two, three. And then don't forget the study guide, okay. Okay, so everybody should have access. Um, can you make it earlier? Why earlier, fabulous cat? What's wrong with Thursday? I like Thursday better. Well, Thursday, um, you have another exam on that day or something? I can't make it, a, no, I'm not allowed to actually. I can only make it um, the day or later. And so one class takes it on Tuesday and then the other class takes it on Thursday. So I'm actually, I'm not allowed to make everybody. So I could, you know, I could, you know, yeah. So you just want to get it done. Anyways, um, all right. So back to, back to things that you're supposed to be able to do. Look at the study guide. <clears throat> if you look at the study guide, you can find, um, oh, I see an answer finally. Okay. I think Thursday is good. Okay. I think that it's the fairest thing. Um, if I, well, I'm not allowed. Actually, I got an email. I mean, everybody, 
uh, got the email, all the teachers got the email that you you have to either follow the schedule or you can you can have it later in the in the week. Um, and I give you all day, so you really you have two more days to study, and then um, your two more days to study, and then you you know you take it any time during the day, just like we did with the third exam. I thought that went pretty well, even if it wasn't the best way to take the exam. Uh, um, you know, so, all right, so you guys are looking at, um, that was weird. I just realized you guys are looking at my screen and I forgot to switch. Okay, so let's go to the student view. You're going to um, look at your study guide, the study guide somewhere way down here somewhere. Where is it? What? Oh, it's way up here, sorry. Upcoming, final exam, okay. So final exam, take a look at the study guide, make sure you get the study guide, okay. If you haven't already gotten it, uh, and here is the study guide, okay? So ignore this part. I'm actually not 70, uh, 17. It's just chapters 15 and 16. So 60 questions from each of the first three exams. Exam one, exam two, exam three, 20 questions each. And then 20 questions from chapter 15 and 20 questions from chapter 16. That makes a total of 100 questions. Okay, so we have chapter 15. We'll start today. I don't know if we'll finish. I think we may not, but we only have two chapters to go. It's a really short uh, study guide, if you look, just two pages, okay? So I have to say that typically the final exam is the best exam for students. And so I think it will be the best exam for you as well, okay? So if you wanna do well, I guarantee one of the best things to do is to look over the old exams and make sure that you really kind of understand the questions. And if you don't understand any of the questions or you feel like um, there's a mistake, I mean, especially if you think there might be a mistake, you wanna to talk to the tutors or talk to me and we'll try to um, you know, help you understand what the question is about. So keep in mind also that the, the tutors are gonna be available. Um, this week and next week, but that's it, okay? So if you go to the schedule, we did have a little change. Um, we changed, we, we got rid of the PAL session yesterday um, because Liz felt that, and actually I agree with her, that um, people wouldn't be able to use it because we hadn't learned anything new. So we have four PAL sessions left, one on Friday, tomorrow, and then we have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay, so Liz is awesome. And some of you have gone to Liz and actually uh, been able to benefit from her help. Uh, the rest of you, if you're interested, there are still four more sessions to go over the last material or anything, really. And, and we do also have our tutors, so make sure that you, you click here before you go to the tutor site. Uh, we did have an issue. One of our tutors went back to Germany, and she missed her session. She has promised me that she will be there for next Tuesday. If you are in a session or you're waiting for a tutor to show up and they don't show up, please send me an email because I can hop on and I'll be your tutor, okay? Uh, not that, uh, you know, that that's something I'm happy to do. Okay, so if the tutor doesn't show, please let me know because they, they promised me they're gonna be there. Um, and if they're not there, that's really uh, unfortunate. Okay, so back to back to me. Hi, hi everybody. Ah, oh, you know, I miss seeing you guys in person. Uh, I, and I really appreciate, thank you so much for sharing what you're doing. And so many of you really had wonderful messages. I wish I could just share them all with you. Um, if you want to share uh, what you're doing positively, I just thought it was so cool. Um, I, I really appreciate it. I read every single one and I, I believe I commented on every single person just to, to let you know that I read it. Um, but if you wanna share those in the discussion section, it's really a lot of positivity. I mean, I read, uh, 250 positive things and I, I, I came away feeling much happier and much more, not just happy, but more confident that we can make it through this. So, you know, all we need is love, all right? So love yourself, take care of yourself, make sure that you realize that this is difficult for everybody and give yourself a break, okay? Don't be, don't be too critical, okay? But anyways, we do have a lot of work to do. So, the only class you cannot procrastinate for is astronomy class. Ha, ha, ha. All right, if you guys are ready, I'm ready to jump in. I'm gonna look for questions. Thursday is okay. Okay, is it timed? Yes, it will be timed. Um, you get two hours for the final exam, two hours for the final exam, okay? All right, so without further ado, if, I, if you are ready, I am going to go ahead and jump into 
chapter 15. Okay, so let me get it started and then I will bump over here and share it with you. Okay, so here we are, chapter 15, the Milky Way. This is our galaxy, kind of like the sun is our sun. This is our galaxy, right? And so uh, the very first thing we want to do, kind of just kind of figure out where we are and you know what's that. But before we do that, actually, I really like uh, what this author has done. He gives you a little story about what it's like to be in astronomy or astrophysics. And um, he, he tells you a little story, a personal story, and I, I really appreciate that. Now, some of you may be interested in, in pursuing a career in astrophysics. Wouldn't that be fun? Okay. And many of you will be affected by humanity's push into space. Not just uh, going to be astronomy, it's going to be every part of our world. At some point, you're going to know people who live in space, or at least work in space, or maybe take vacations in space, and you might be one of them. Uh, but we are going to talk about galaxies now, okay? And definitely understanding the Milky Way was a big part of that. What is the Milky Way? Now, you might be surprised to know that we didn't know, not, I mean, it's really recent, uh, less than 100 years ago, we thought that the Milky Way was everything, the entire universe, right? And then things happen, right? We developed the technology and we looked more carefully and we learned, and we learned some really, really interesting things. We learned that the Milky Way is just one, one galaxy amongst many. Okay, we're gonna start off with a person. You need to know the name, Bob Benjamin, write it down. Bob Benjamin was a graduate student and Bob Benjamin was, was, was doing uh, radio astronomy and he discovered something really cool and um, he actually wrote an article about it. So this picture shows you something very interesting. So this is the Milky Way. It looks like a, just a line, but the reason is that we are inside of the galaxy, right? We're inside of the galaxy. So we, we and it's a disc. So we see it in one direction or in the opposite direction, right? We're, we're in the middle of a disc looking around. So there's a lot of stuff in the middle, but not so much stuff above and below. But Bob Benjamin was studying these very hot clouds of gases that seemed to be flying away from the, from the disk of the Milky Way. And he gave them a name, and you wanna write this down, it's called the Galactic Fountain, okay? So he wrote a paper about it, and this is a new discovery. And the way science works is when you publish a paper, um, the editor of the paper will take your paper and send it out to experts in the field that your paper is in and ask them to read the paper and comment on it and to critique it and point out where the flaws in the research might be. And if, if, it's, if, it's, if they agree that it's good, then the paper is published. It's called peer review. And if it's not good, then the referees will send back their comments and you as the author of the paper have to address their comments. So I had to do this too. And you know, I don't have a huge number of papers, but every paper that I've done, there was some aspect of it that needed to be tweaked or, or corrected. And the, and the peers, peer, review, peer reviewers would give me feedback, right? And then they would say, this is awesome. This is amazing. This is incredible. So this is what happened to Bob Benjamin. And one of his referees, was a man by the name of Lyman Spitzer. You can write that name down. This is a pretty famous name in astronomy. Not, I mean, not as many people know him, but what, what became famous is the telescope that was named after him, the Spitzer Space Telescope. It's an infrared telescope, which is awesome. Now, if you were here at school, I could show you, actually, I could show you. Why not? I just show you, I just show you. I could do all this stuff now. I don't have to do just what's on the slide set anymore. And actually that doesn't make sense to. Um, if I go to, uh, let me see, I'm gonna show you this because why not? The Spitzer tuning fork. Oh, that's awesome. I can just show you. I'd say, I could say, go look outside. Uh, let's see, this is an amazing. This is uh, beautiful. Okay, so um, here we go. I'm looking at a website. Actually, I'm looking at Amazon. This is a, a poster that I have outside of the PS 101. 
It's called the Spitzer tuning fork. So if you don't know it, a tuning fork is a musical device that has a certain frequency and has a shape that looks something like this. There's a handle that you hold, and then there are these two metal pieces that go in two directions. So this tuning fork is meant to illustrate, if you look right here, there's gonna be a certain type of galaxy and uh, you just read the name, it says elliptical. And then as you go up one branch, you see the unbarred spirals. And then along the other branch is the barred spirals. And then in the middle, we have intermediate spirals. Okay, and then over here, we have those galaxies that don't fit. <laughs> they're irregulars, right? They're, they're a discount price. That's a joke, sorry. I'm trying to be humorous. I've noticed that my humor is really scaled back because you guys are here to laugh at my jokes, even if they're not funny. Uh, so anyways, any comments? Okay, no comments. All right. See, you guys are so quiet. I don't, I'm just like, I'm speaking into a vacuum. And in a vacuum, no one can hear your voice. No, I'm just kidding. I know you guys are there, uh, but sometimes it's harder because you guys aren't right in front of me. I don't, I can't gauge your reaction. So anyways, yeah, back to whatever. Whatever, Sean, get over it. Okay. So Lyman Spitzer was a referee for Bob Benjamin's paper. And um, he ended up becoming a collaborator. So after this initial uh, uh, paper, it turns out they ended up working together quite a lot. But I wanna share with you why Lyman Spitzer was so important for Bob Benjamin. Bob Benjamin wrote this article about these gases, these high energy uh, gases that were, uh, seemed to be jetting away from the Milky Way. But you know how gravity works. What happens to things that are, that are starting to move away from the Milky Way? Eventually they fall back down to the Milky Way. They can't actually escape. What force is holding them there? And you know the answer. Yes, of course, gravity, okay? So Lyman Spitzer loved this article. He was so excited because for years, they had been working on a problem and there was no solution at the time. And the problem was that any, whatever direction you look in the Milky Way, the elemental materials that you see are basically the same. And so it seems to be kind of homogeneous. What does homogeneous mean? The same throughout, homogenized milk it has been heated and what it does is it causes the little droplets of fat to be dispersed, right? It's homogenized. So homogenized, right? Well, actually that's pasteurized. Homogenized means it's been mixed thoroughly. Okay, mixed thoroughly. Anyways, mixed thoroughly. So the question was, how does it mix? How does the Milky Way mix? It's a big thing, it's huge. How do the gases and, and dust from one part of the Milky Way get into another part? And finally, they had an answer with, uh, Bob Benjamin's Galactic Fountain. Okay, so here is a picture of our Milky Way and we see it, remember Galileo looked up and uh, before Galileo, people did not know that the Milky Way is made of individual stars. They just see it as smeared out, they saw it as smeared out light from one side of the horizon to the other. Now, again, if I were in the classroom, I would tell you a funny little story does anybody want to hear a funny little story? You're not even here to say, yes, you want to hear a funny little story. I'm going to tell you anyways. Um, a funny little story. Back in the 90s, uh, the, the year of the, I can't remember the year now, 894, maybe 94, um, the Northridge earthquake was pretty, uh, pretty damaging. And actually, electricity went out to a huge part of the LA area. And um, people you know, that was, that was bad enough. But what was really funny was a funny, this is funny, this is actually a funny part. People were calling 911 to report this mysterious light in the sky. They didn't know what it was. And the, and the answer was, it was the Milky Way. They had never seen it before because the light pollution in LA is so strong, they literally can't see it. And they finally had this view. And this is a breathtaking view so one of the things that you should all have on your bucket list, if you have never seen a dark sky, meaning there's no moon and you're far away from a city, this is something that will captivate you. It's something so beautiful. It's so marvelous. It just kind of transcends um, our 
puny little human bodies and takes us out into space. It's something that you need to experience. It's really beautiful. It will transform your soul. And so that's actually kind of one of the parts that I love about Galileo. Galileo was so captivated, but then he was the very first person to look up with his telescope and see that this big smear of light was actually individual stars. And what a magnificent feeling that must have been to realize that all of this light is coming from stars. But this is our Milky Way. And we see the Milky Way. There's actually um, a summertime part, which is going to be uh, uh, dimmer. Uh, no, that's not true. Sorry. Summer, summertime part, which is brighter, and a wintertime part that is dimmer. I'm sorry. I should know that. I do know that. And the reason is that in the summertime, the part of the Milky Way you're looking at is the center of the Milky Way. And so when you stare to this part, it looks brighter. And over here in the wintertime sky, uh, you're going to see a dimmer part of the, uh, uh, you're looking away from the, actually, this is not the winter time necessarily, it's on the other side. But anyway, it's kind of like this, you see how much dimmer it is over here. So over here, we have the center of the Milky Way, and over here, you're far away from the center, you're looking away. And so we are living in a disk of a Milky Way. So you want to write down, number one, you need to know that there are 400 billion stars, that's our best estimate right now, 400 billion stars. Now, some of you may be reading the news. There are actually a, a number of people that believe there are actually a lot more stars than that. But I need to write something down. I'm going to write down 400 billion stars. And they are gravitationally bound together. So that means the force of gravity is enough to keep them here. Okay. Uh, so actually, you know what? I, let me tell you a couple other things that you need to know right now. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to, skip from that. I'm going to show you uh, a couple of things that you need to know. In fact, let's go ahead and let's do a quick sketch of the Milky Way. A couple of things that you need to know. So let's start off. We're going to draw a picture of the Milky Way and it is a big disk. Now it's mainly the pancake, but not entirely. So this is this, is this pancake or disk, right? The disk. This is called the galactic disk. of the Milky Way. It has 400 billion stars. Make sure that you've made a note of that. You need to know that. And the dimensions, how big is it? And so from one edge to the other of this disk, we think it's about 100,000, oh, sorry about the comma, 100,000 light years across. That is amazing, right? What does that mean? Uh, it means that if light tried to travel from one side of the Milky Way to the other, it would take 100,000 years. Now, we are going to use another unit. We're going to actually use the parsec quite a lot. And so I want to make sure that you understand. If you remember, one parsec was 3.26 light years. If you divide this by three, you probably understand why this is about 30,000 parsecs. Okay. Now we're going to start dealing with really big distances. So instead of having to write 30,000 every time, I'm going to just write it as 30 kpc. So what is a kpc, right? And if you if you don't automatically see it, it's called a kilo parsec, right? And the prefix kilo means kilo kilo k is a thousand, right? Ten to the third. Okay, so this is about 30 kilo. You need to memorize both of them, right? These two numbers, you need to memorize those numbers. You need to memorize this number right here, the number of stars. So we're gonna talk more about this structure, but I just wanna start you off. You have a picture of the Milky Way, and these are some of the numbers that you need to know about it, just because you need to know. How big is this galaxy that you live in, okay? All right, so back to our, our PowerPoint. Uh, why did that happen? Let's see. Oh, well, does it matter? Can I just verify? Actually, I'm going to just go ahead and just make sure I'm sharing the, the slide. There we go. Now you guys should be able to see. Okay. And um, again, if you have any problems, just leave me a comment in, in the YouTube chat. Okay. So are there clues about where we are? in the Milky Way. Is there anything that we can do? Can we just look up at the sky and figure out where we are in the Milky Way? Well, this is something that people have been asking for quite a while. 
And so I want you to learn about uh, some of the first uh, attempts to, to figure out where are we in the universe, right? Where are we? Where is our, our solar system? Where is our sun in the big picture, right? This is the big picture. And remember what I said, up until uh, 100 years ago, a little less than 100 years ago, people thought that everything that we can see in the sky was everything, right? That that's the entire universe. Okay, so keep that in mind as we begin talking about some of our, our, our astronomers. So one of the astronomers, uh, actually a pair of astronomers that you wanna know are the Herschel siblings. They were a brother and sister team and uh, they worked together to study the Milky Way. So you can see they were uh, about the same age. You know, William was the older brother and Caroline was a little bit younger. And, um, but they worked together. So William was the telescope builder. And actually you may remember the name Herschel. He was the person who discovered the planet Uranus with a telescope, the first planet to be discovered with a telescope. But what he wanted to do, and he and his sister worked together to, to, to try, try to figure this out. They wanted to figure out what does the milk, what does the universe look like? Where, how, do, how are the stars distributed? Are they equally distributed everywhere? And the answer is, of course not, right? There's definitely this band of stars in the middle of the sky that we see that we call the Milky Way. How are the stars distributed in the Milky Way? And so they did this work very studiously, very carefully. They mapped out the positions of the stars in the Milky Way. And here is a picture which allowed them to show, this is, this is their idea. So they, they really got this idea, this is you, that they were more concentrated in the middle, right? There's more concentration in the middle, but they had this idea that what they were looking at was a disc that had been tilted on its edge, right? And, and therefore it was kind of oblong instead of, cir instead of circular. So a grindstone actually, I don't know if anybody knows what a grindstone is. This is this is something that I would never do, but because I'm right at my computer and I can easily do it, let me just um, let me just go ahead and bring up uh, the Google, and uh, and show you something. This is put. So I'm gonna I'm gonna actually share what I'm doing here. Sorry, I'm gonna bring up the Google. Hey Google, show me a picture of a grindstone with a grindstone. Oh, there it is. That's a grindstone. Cool. So a grindstone is a wheel uh, thing. And if you take a, a wheel and you put it on its edge, right? If you put it on, on its edge, oh, what the heck? Yeah, more like this. You see, it stops looking so circular. Uh, here's a grindstone for grinding, uh, milling uh, wheat or something like that. I don't know if I can see any more like that. There's a lot of different pictures, aren't there? Oh, yeah. You see how it stops looking circular. And the more you tilt it, the more uh, oblong, the uh, more elliptical it looks. Okay, I'm not seeing one that's really on its side, but uh, all right, well, okay. So that was a very hopeful, helpful Google. But anyways, okay, there you go. I don't know what I'm looking at, Never mind. Okay, so we're looking at, yeah, that was not really that useful, okay. Anyways, how about a disc, a disc? Um, and actually a few years ago, uh, somebody says, I don't know what a disc is. And I said, well, how about a pancake? And it turns out most people know what pancakes are. Um, and the reason I think that's funny is uh, years and years ago, I went to, um, to a wonderful trip to Europe and I stayed uh, with some friends in Denmark and they had never had American pancakes before. And I made them pancakes and it was, they were so excited because they finally got to taste an American pancake and they were really bad, but you know, I didn't tell them. Uh, but hopefully years later, they had real pancakes baked by someone who's co uh, competent. I'm not a very good cook. Uh, anyways, okay. So they um, they looked up and, and they saw this disk of stars, but they assumed that the sun was at the center and it looked that way. It kind of looked as though the stars were arranged around the sun. So we will learn that that is not correct, right? So you need to know that as much as the, this, this work helped move science, it definitely was not, not correct, right? So we want to understand what wasn't right about that. But they saw the shape uh, of a disk, and it turns out it is, in fact, a disk, just much bigger than what they saw. 
Okay, so we're going to learn the name of another uh, astronomer who um, actually improved upon uh, their methodology. And the next fellow we want to talk about, and he's a really famous guy, is Jacobus Captain. Okay, actually, I don't know if he's so famous. He is kind of pretty famous, but um, but one of the things that he did is he did a better job. He actually was able to do a, a better job at star counting, right? Similar to the, the Herschels, he counted stars and made maps uh, of the stars. And he was able to see that the Milky Way was a flattened disk, right? Just like the same idea as the Herschels, 10 kiloparsecs across and two kiloparsecs thick, right? High. And so that's pretty cool. Here's a, a picture of, of what, he, what he discovered, right? Here's a disc. Remember, we're looking at it on its edge. That's why it looks like this. And if we looked at it uh, face on, it would look like a circle, okay? So he counted stars as well. And the way that he did it is he took photographs. And so he was very careful to position the stars where they appeared and was able to make this, this picture. That's awesome. But we understand the problem now, right? And, and actually wanna make sure you understand. The problem is that when you look in visible light at the stars in the Milky Way, you cannot actually see all of the stars, right? Number one, interstellar dust blocks much of it. Right? A, a lot of stars are not gonna be seen. And so you're not gonna be able to see all of the stars. And then a second problem is that we just can't see all of the stars in the Milky Way. They're gonna to be too, too dim for us to see all of them. And definitely can't see them with the naked eye, but even, even a telescope cannot see all of them. So, but this is the biggest problem, right? Interstellar dust blocks your view. You can't see them. So if you are counting stars, you're gonna find uh, that you find uh, the, you find that the Milky Way is a disk, that's great, except, there's a problem. You're going to find the sun in the middle of the disk. And the reason is you can't really see the full structure. Right? You can't see it all. So this is a problem. This doesn't work. Okay, so counting stars is a failed method for finding uh, the shape of the Milky Way. It just does not work, right? You cannot actually get the full picture. So you want to understand that this is, this is a flawed methodology. What could be better? Okay, what could be better? And so we get to our, our final character right here. Write down the name, Harlow Shapley. Harlow Shapley, he will be important uh, for another story we're gonna tell in the next chapter. Harlow Shapley was um, an astronomer who's instead of focusing on individual stars, he studied these things called globular clusters. So we've talked about these before. And one of the things you're supposed to know is they are old clusters of stars. Remember that? We talked about um, the HR diagram, what it looked like when you look at these star clusters is that there's no new stars. There's no young, there's no, sorry, there's no large mass stars anymore. There's no young stars. These are old stars. And so the HR diagram is incomplete. The upper end of the, of the HR diagram that includes the high mass stars uh, have left the main sequence. They have aged off the main sequence. So he looked at globular clusters. And now this is a part, actually, you know what? Let's just see if we can, they're just beautiful. They are so beautiful. And one of my favorite ones is starting to come into view in the early evening. Um, so if this summer, you know, we, we are able to have a star party. Um, I really encourage you to please attend a star party because you'll be able to see um, one of the best ones is so beautiful, uh, M13. And so actually, let me just uh, take you on a little visual journey, <clears throat> globular clusters. Let's see if we can see some pictures. Okay, I'm gonna shift back to the Google here. You can do this yourself, you know, online, sorry. Uh, but we're gonna look at globular clusters for a moment. Here's globular clusters. So a globular cluster, spherical, it's spherical. Okay, collection of stars. Oh shoot, you're getting away. Ah, darn. Okay, forget this. Okay, 
Now look at this, just look at images, just look at pictures, don't worry about that. Oh, these are beautiful. That's not a globular cluster. This is, these are globular clusters, right? Here's two right next to each other. Oh, that's awesome. These are beautiful. And actually I do, this is a list of globular clusters because there's not very many. That's actually kind of important. Um, so let's just see something. Let's see if the number has changed. I don't think it has changed. Ooh, look at all these globular clusters. Oh, and you see how they have M numbers? These are messy objects and M13 is one of my favorites. Oh, that is an awesome one. The Hercules globular cluster. Oh, it's magical. It's so beautiful. It just, oh man, I can't even tell you, but I hope you'll get a chance to look through a telescope at that but it's just spectacular. So there's a lot of globular clusters. Okay, wow, uh-oh, I didn't know that. Okay, so actually what you need to know, it doesn't actually, there's not a very long list. Okay, it doesn't actually say, okay, it doesn't say how many uh, globular, let's just see, okay. Let's see if it is, uh, 150, okay. Oh, could be, a, oh, darn it, there are, okay, but here's the number you wanna know. There are 150, globular clusters, but actually there's a new, there's a new one, huh? Oh, I don't know this. This is August, 2007. Uh-oh. Oh, 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 okay, 157. I don't know what to say. I feel like I just gained new knowledge. Do you guys need to know that? I think you need to know that. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking at you. You need to know that the number is not 150 anymore. My information was old. And since I took the time with you to look, you now need to know that there are 157 globular clusters. You need to know that. 100, this is a brand new thing, right? I've never told anybody this before because I didn't know it. There are 157 globular clusters in the Milky Way. Okay, that's not too many, right? We're not talking billions, we're talking 157, right? So anyways, uh, yeah, so, all right, you're like, why do I need to know that, Sean? Okay, you need to know this, you need to know this because Harlow Shapley studied the globular clusters. Of course, he didn't know there were 157, but he knew that there weren't very many. And what he did is, as he discovered their locations, he made a map of them, a three-dimensional map. And what he discovered was that they create a spherical shape. They themselves are spheres, but they are making a spherical shape. So here is a picture kind of showing you the globular clusters. And you want to understand that they are arranged in a shape like this, like a you know, big. So these are these balls of stars. And they are orbiting around the center of the galaxy. So he was the first person to be able to use the globular clusters. There's only 150, right? 157, we now know. And in that way, find the center of that cluster of clusters. And that was the center of the Milky Way. So from that, he found that the distance was 16 kiloparsecs, but in fact, that's not quite right. So um, it turns out the real distance to our sun is eight kiloparsecs. Okay, so I'm gonna, Pause for a moment. Let's go back to our picture of the Milky Way. Let's go back to our picture of the Milky Way. And let's try to understand something important, right? That there is a center to the Milky Way. And if this whole distance is 30, then what is the radius? Okay, well, half of 30 would be 15, right? And the distance to the sun is Eight. Now, right in the middle is seven and a half, so just a little bit past the middle to the edge. Okay, here is our sun. Okay, so this distance from the middle to the sun is eight kilo parsecs. That's 8,000 parsecs. It's about 25,000 light years. Okay, about 25,000 light years. Just a little more than 25,000 light years. Okay, so now we have a little bit more detail. And the reason that Shapley was able to do this, right, is because he studied not the individual stars, but the clusters, the globular cluster distribution. That's pretty cool. 
And so he was right. He was the first person to understand the sun is not the center of the Milky Way, that there is actually a real center, okay? And so how did Harlow Shapley determine where the sun and Milky Way is? This will be a picture that you guys, uh, this will be one of the questions in the, the, the quiz that you have to take afterwards. And so what's the answer? Did he map the distribution of stars in the disk? Did he map the distribution of gas clouds in the arms? Did he map the distribution of objects in nearby galaxies? Or did he map the distribution of globular clusters? And the answer is the globular clusters, D, okay? All right, so let's learn the rest of the parts of the Milky Way. So you wanna be able to sketch a picture of the Milky Way. And so there it is, right? There's a picture, okay. So we're gonna go ahead and, and talk a little bit more about this. Um, if you look at this big circle, the circle, this is actually a sphere and it's almost, it's almost the same size. It really, we're, we're gonna say it's about the same size as the as the disc right here so this is 30 kilo parsecs the size of the sphere is also 30 kilo parsecs in diameter and this is where we find the globular clusters it is called the stellar halo so this area a spherical halo around the milky way is 30 kilo parsecs in size and it's where we find the globular clusters the sun is eight kiloparsecs away from the center. And what we also understand is that there is a bulge in the middle of the Milky Way. And it's about, I don't know if you can estimate, right? It's about five kiloparsecs, I wanna say. Five, is that right? I think so. Five kiloparsecs, oh, well, actually it looks maybe even bigger, but I, maybe 10 actually, now that I look at it, five kiloparsecs in radius, about 10 kiloparsecs in diameter. So five kiloparsecs in radius is a bulge, okay. Uh, and then what else? Okay, the thickness of the disc has been estimated. So the thickness of the pancake at the edge over here is about 0.6 kiloparsecs, okay. So, um, yeah, that's actually, so you wanna write these things down, but what does it even mean? And actually let's translate it, okay? So uh, we've got this, this uh, disc, we've got the halo, we have a bulge, and we have a thickness at the edge, which is about uh, 0.6 kiloparsecs. So just so you know, 0.6 kiloparsecs is about 2000 light years. Okay, about 2,000 light years. Okay, and then the central bulge, what did we say? Central bulge, we'll make it about, uh, about 10 kiloparsecs in diameter and five kiloparsecs in radius. Okay. Okay, so those are observable. Um, just so you take a look right here, point you could write down these conversions that you should be able to identify. 0.6 kiloparsecs, the thickness of the disk of the Milky Way is about 2000 light years. And the central bulge is 10 kiloparsecs in diameter, about five kiloparsecs in radius, okay? I guess the last thing I, I did mention, the eight kiloparsecs, uh, I could do this a little bit. So three times eight is 24, and then 0.26, let me do 0.25, that'd be two. So it's about, 26,000 light years, right? Eight kiloparsecs, okay? All right, so those are dimensions of the Milky Way that you have to be aware of, okay? So you need to memorize the dimensions of the Milky Way. Hola, Erica, okay. Uh, so anyways, um, let's see, okay, back to the screen share. Okay, so those are just the dimensions. You've got to memorize those things, okay? How many stars are there in the Milky Way? Uh, maybe you can remember 400 billion stars. Okay, that's a lot of stars. There's probably even more, but that's good enough. Okay, now it turns out something really cool happens. Uh, the, uh, a star may not actually be right in the middle of the circular disk. This is a really, really interesting thing. And this book does this. I've never, it wasn't in our last astronomy textbook. I really like this idea. 
It's very, very fun. What happens if it turns out you're not exactly, exactly, exactly right in the middle of the disc? You're just a little bit above or a little bit below. Then what force will pull you down to the disc? Okay, and the answer is the force of gravity. So and let's follow a blue line right here. So I'm getting pulled down to the disc because of the force of gravity pulls me down. This is why the disc is a disc, right? Remember how gravity flattens the shape into the shape of a disc, right? Well, I'm getting pulled down to the disc, but there's really nothing there, right? It's probably mostly empty space. So when the star is moving down to the disc, it gets to this position and there's no more force of gravity to pull it down, but it just keeps moving because of its inertia. And so it overshoots the center and ends up going over here. But now gravity is gonna slow it down, slow it down, slow it down, stops it, and this time gravity is going to pull it up to the disc, pull it, pull it, pull it, pull it, pull it, stops pulling, but now it keeps drifting up and gravity slows it down, slows it down, slows it down, stops it. And so it oscillates up and down above and below the disc of the Milky Way. This is probably what all the stars are doing if they're not exactly in the center, including our sun. And this motion must be very slow. It's not very, not a rapid motion at all. And we have, you know, really this is going to be something that we we don't know for sure if our sun is doing it, although I think it has to be because it's not exactly in the center plane of the disk of the Milky Way. And so we can assume that our sun must be doing that and even estimate how often it does this. I do not know the oscillation period, although that's a really fun question if, uh, if anybody wants to ask that question. Did anybody ask that question? Nobody asked that question. What is the oscillation period? What a great question. That's an awesome question. I don't know the answer. Maybe somebody could do the research and find out. Okay. So material in the disk revolves around the galactic center on orbits that are generally circular. You need to know that. And as stars go around the Milky Way, like our sun, they also tend to move you know, up and down, right? So let's write this down. The disk contains a mix of young, blue, metal-rich stars, as well as older, redder stars. And so they orbit around the star. Okay, so the, the stars that we find in the disk of the Milky Way include some young stars. And these stars are known as population one stars. So you wanna write that down. Population one stars are found in the disk. What is generally true about those population one stars? Well, there's gonna be young stars there, right? Any young star by definition must be a population one star. And where is it found? It's found in the disk of the Milky Way. That's where the new stars are being born. So you can infer something important. Where in the Milky Way galaxy are we going to find a lot of ISM, interstellar medium? Where will we find it? And the answer is, of course, in the disk, right? If you find new stars there, that's because there's material there to, that can form stars, okay? So population one stars are young, right? They're, or well, at least they have the possibility of being young and they are found in the disk of the Milky Way. And by definition also, they have higher metallicity. So younger stars, remember, include material that formed earlier in earlier generations of stars. And remember that every generation of stars, when they explode, they enrich the material nearby and they make the next generation uh, a higher metallicity, enriched in heavier elements, right? Heavier elements. The population one, they are younger, tend to be younger, they're found in the disk and they have higher metallicity. Okay, so you can understand if I'm calling population one, those stars, there must be population two, right? So we're gonna to get to those in just a minute. So a spiral galaxy looks like a pinwheel and it has arms or it says may or may not have spiral arms. Okay, I will tell you about that. Uh, spiral arm is a spiral shaped distribution of stars and in interstellar medium often sending uh, from the bulge outward. So most astronomers agree that there are up to four major spiral arms in our galaxy. There is a little debate about this, and I, I will show you the, a picture of what we think the Milky Way looks like, but there are plenty of, of reasons to think that this may evolve and change in the future, right? Our information is just not complete yet. We're learning more every year as the technology gets better, as the resolution of our cameras get bigger, 
uh, better as our, as our telescopes get larger. And, and this is actually incredibly important for us because uh, the, the way that we detect, well, we're gonna learn this, uh, radio astronomy is really important. Uh, so um, last year, uh, the first picture of a, tele of a black hole was taken. This turns out to be, this telescope will be incredibly powerful for looking at the structure of the Milky Way and other galaxies because of the radio astronomy. It can see the molecular clouds and it can see the uh, cold H1 regions of, the, of, the, of our uh, galaxy. Okay, so the halo we said is a spherical region where we find the globular clusters, right? That's where we find the, and now you know the number 157, this is wrong. Well, it's approximately, but it's now 157. I should edit that, okay? And what else? Um, these globular clusters are orbiting the center of the Milky Way. They're orbiting. They can have 100,000 stars, right? Each globular cluster. They're orbiting the Milky Way, but they don't orbit in the same way. They orbit in all different directions, okay? Globular clusters orbit in all different directions. So they're kind of randomly orbiting the center of the Milky Way. Okay, this is an important part that you need to know. And these are called population two, okay? Population two stars, population two stars. So it says mainly, there's very, very few stars that are, they're actually essentially none. It's, it, so I, instead of saying mainly, it's basically the stars in the globular clusters are population two stars. I mean, really don't, don't ham. It's, it's the right thing to say, okay? All right, so yeah, all right. Something that's interesting, okay, all right, so I lied. There may actually be a few, few things up there besides uh, just the globular clusters, but really not much. So remember back to Bob Benjamin when he observed the galactic fountain? Um, we now know that we can see these even better when we use X-ray telescopes. And this, this stellar halo includes very, very high temperature gases. Uh, but in particular, the, uh, we will see jets of, of gases going away from the Milky Way. These are gonna be called coronal gases and they indicate some very high energy event has occurred, okay? So X-ray observations indicate that the stellar halo may be full of a gas at a temperature of more than a million. Remember that was called coronal gas. And if you remember, the halo does not contain any newborn stars, right? They do not have any new stars, no new stars there. Why? Because there's no dense material there, okay? Uh, so if you, any questions right now, I'm just gonna come back and take a look. I'm just jumping through here. Nobody's saying anything. So uh, if you have questions, make sure to interrupt me or just ask it in the chat. I'll keep checking. The halo does not contain any newborn stars. So population two does not have uh, new stars. So population two stars, which are found primarily in the halo, have lower metallicity. Uh-oh, what does that mean? They are stars that were born early. They're, they're the first couple generations of stars uh, in the universe, right? And, and, and they're part of our Milky Way, of course, okay? The material from which population two stars was formed was relatively pristine compared to the metal rich material found in the stars, okay? Okay, so there's a bulge. This is kind of an important thing. Actually, um, at this point, I, I list, after the slide, I'm gonna do something on the board or on a piece of paper. The bulge is a roughly spherical distribution of stars and interstellar material in the central region of the galaxy. And it's very dense. Actually, can you write this down? The Milky Way bulge is about five kiloparsecs in radius, and the stars are packed tightly together with typical stellar densities reaching as high as 1,600 stars per cubic parsec. Write that down. 1,600 stars per cubic density, uh, cubic parsec. That is the bulge density. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'll write that down again for you. Um, the bulge, so the stellar density, stellar density. The density of stars, right? Right, star density, star density. That's what it says, okay? In the bulge, we said is 1600 stars per 
parsec cubed, right? Per kilo par, per um, per cubic parsec. Okay. So what does that mean? If I take a cube, which is one parsec and one parsec and one parsec, oops, sorry, one parsec, right? Take a cube. There are 1600 stars within that. What? That's crazy. Okay. So now, if I want to want to really help you understand uh, how dense that is, this is kind of crazy. It's amazing, really dense. Uh, how about around the sun, around our sun, soul, right? It's called soul. Okay. So here's the sun, and I want to uh, remind you something important. Does anybody remember how far away the nearest star is? Da, 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 da. Da, da, da. I'm just waiting for a second, and maybe somebody will answer. That would be awesome if somebody wants to try to answer. Does anybody remember the distance to the nearest star? How far away is the nearest star? Anybody remember? Okay, so I've waited quite a while, and um, I know you guys just found out, but nobody's writing anything. Okay, so the answer is about 4.2 light years, right? So the nearest star is 4.2 light years, which means that actually there is no star in one parsec from the sun, right? This is our nearest star, uh, Proxima Centauri. Okay, 4.2 light years away. And this is 3.26. So there is literally nobody one parsec this way or one parsec, yeah, 4.3, that's fine, it's fine. So actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine that we, we actually imagine that in any direction, there's not going to be any stars, one parsec in any direction from our sun. Yeah, Proxima Centauri. Okay, so what I want to do is show you something, right? I could make a square, a cube, sorry, a cube around the sun and... I don't know if this is going to look very good. I don't know if you guys are understanding this. Oh, I'm not even understanding it. Okay. And this cube, this doesn't really look very good. So let me just do it again. The cube that I've just drawn is two parsecs, two parsecs, two parsecs on a side, right? So if you look at that, what does that mean? The volume of this cube is two times two times two. It's gonna be eight parsecs cubed. And how many stars are there in this, in this region? Well, there's just the one star, the sun. So the density is gonna be one star divided by eight, parsecs cubed, which is going to be one eighth of a star per cubic parsec. So it's going to be 0.125 stars per cubic parsec. So this is the density near us. And this is the density in the galactic center, right? So you can see what an amazing difference it is. 0.125. Uh, stars per cubic parsec, 1,600 stars per cubic parsec. They're just not even close to each other. All right, so back to our slide. And I will back to our slide. Okay, so they're really, really densely packed. Okay, this is kind of an amazing thing. Uh, so where is it? This is kind of a fun story. Oh, I like this. Uh, if you were um, in the lab, actually, um, this is a summertime constellation. This is uh, the teapot of Sagittarius. And so there's a, there's a handle right here. This is the top of the teapot. And here's the spout of the teapot, right? I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here's my handle. Here is my spout. 
When you tip me over, hear me shout. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Oh yeah, okay, so now here's the deal. If you go to the spout, I'm gonna show you a little thing right here. And you take this, this is actually the arrow of the archer, Sagittarius the archer. There's a centaur firing an arrow right here. This is the tip of the arrow. And if you go off the tip and up, you find the center of the Milky Way. That's kind of a neat thing uh, to be able to know that because there's something really important. What is at the center of the Milky Way galaxy? This is kind of important. What is at the center of the Milky Way galaxy? The center of the Milky Way galaxy. Sorry, I need to stop and make sure you know that. What is at the center? What is at the heart of a Tootsie Roll? Tootsie Pop, Tootsie Roll, Pop. Let's see, Paul, never mind. What is at the center? What is at the center of the Milky Way galaxy? And the answer is, I know you guys know this. Let's see if anybody answers. A black hole, yes. A super massive black Oh, okay, you need to know that. And what is the name of this super massive black hole? It is called Sagittarius A star. That's the name. Okay, you need to know that name. That's that is our super massive black hole, right? The center of our Milky Way galaxy is that super massive black hole. Okay. So that is a really important black hole for us. Okay, so here's a funny little thing. We do find something interesting. Um, if you look at these arms of, of this spiral galaxy, this is a spiral galaxy, you'll notice that they don't come out of a center, but they come out of the end of, of this. The, the center has been stretched out somehow. And so this is called a barred spiral. So you wanna write down uh, the name for the Milky Way, sorry, the Milky Way. So the Milky Way is not just a spiral, it's a barred spiral galaxy. That's the name that we give it, okay, a barred spiral. So what does it mean? So there are spiral galaxies that look like this, right? You got a center and then you have these arms that come out of the center, right? Something like that. That's a spiral galaxy. And then you have a barred spiral. And the center is almost elongated, almost like two centers or stretched out or something. And then the arms come out of the end of this, right? Something like that. So a barred spiral has an elongated center. Almost like it was stretched, hint, hint, right? So one of the, the questions that I have for you is how did it happen? Why do some galaxies appear to be stretched? What could have happened to stretch a galaxy? How do you stretch a galaxy? What do you do? How do you stretch it out like that? That's weird, right? So you're going to need to know something that galaxies can can be kind of uh, you know not stretched and then sometimes stretched. What stretches a galaxy? Why would some galaxies be stretched out? Anybody have an idea? What could make them stretch out? I've got a few people watching. Anybody who's watching might have an idea. Why does a galaxy stretch out? What could stretch out a galaxy? Wonder what it could be. Okay, well, um, good question. Okay, so I'm gonna write down the answer because I want you to know this. The answer is tidal force. Okay, what's tidal force? Anybody remember what tidal force means? A force, a difference in the force of gravity. So what happens um, to a galaxy when it experiences a tidal force, it gets elongated, it gets stretched out. Gravity is the right answer, that's the answer, tidal force. And so what had to happen is we have galaxies that are flying past each other, right? And as a result, the gravitational field 
from one galaxy can affect another galaxy and stretch it, right? The tidal forces are gonna stretch it. And by the way, they'll stretch each other, not just one of them will be affected. But when galaxies are flying past each other, we're gonna see that this, this uh, interaction causes them to be stretched out. So this is what I would like you to know, the tidal force from another galaxy could be an explanation, another galaxy. How do you spell galaxy? I misspelled that. Galaxy, sorry about that. Does everybody know what galaxy means? Galaxy means actually milk, right? Actually means milky, okay, milk, galaxy. The word galaxy in Greek means milk. All righty, so. All right, so let's get back to our slides. Okay, so how do we see the galaxy? How do we actually know what's there? And, and that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, so we're, we're kind of, this really kind of should be the next thing, but that's okay, well, let's write it down right now. What is, um, we have a name for all of the galaxies that are nearby, and these are known as the local group. So you wanna write down local group, the group of galaxies that are near the Milky Way. Okay, near the Milky Way. So in the center of this picture, we have uh, the plane of the Milky Way. We're gonna be in the center of that, okay? And we're looking at, oh no, here's the Milky Way. Sorry, here's the Milky Way. This is our Milky Way. Our Milky Way is here, sorry about that. Uh, what's the nearest spiral galaxy to us? I need to know the Andromeda galaxy is the nearest spiral, just a little bit closer, I guess, than the pinwheel. See, yeah, 725 kilo parsecs, okay. And then we do have a number of dwarf galaxies that are orbiting uh, the Milky Way. That's kind of interesting. We'll learn more about those later. We're actually in the process of eating some of them um, because they're too close. And um, what do you wanna know? Well, so these are gravitationally bound. So you write down 14 satellites, you know, it's a handful of, it's a handful of galaxies. I don't know the exact number. I mean, I guess we could count one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, four. I, I, I didn't get fourteen, but okay. Let's put Milky Way galaxy as orbit. So that'd be like fifteen galaxies. Okay, fifteen galaxies. Okay, it's just a handful of galaxies. I don't think you need to know the number. I, I don't want you to know a number. Let's say local group, the group of galaxies that are connected to each other by the force of gravity, and these galaxies will be with us forever. Okay, they're, we're, they're never gonna leave us behind. The universe is expanding, you might know that, uh, but no matter what, these galaxies will always stay with us. Okay, it's called the local group. Um, so many smaller galaxies are on orbits that will lead to a collision with the Milky Way. And how do we, how do we know this, right? Well, so one of the things that we see, actually, um, I guess it, it's not coming in quite now, but we do actually see material falling from that galaxy being ripped off of that galaxy and being pulled into the Milky Way. The large and small Magellanic clouds are examples of this. Okay, so what are the observable structural components of the Milky Way? Again, this will be a question that you have to answer on the quiz that you take right afterwards. So let's make sure you can do this. Uh, is it globular clusters, bulge, and stellar halo? Is it dust, disc, bulge, stellar halo? Is it disc, spiral arms, galactic center? Is it a spiral arms, population one star, stellar halo? Okay, so the answer is disc, bulge, halo, okay? Globular clusters are found in the halo, that doesn't work. Uh, the spiral arms are found in the disc. The spiral arms are where you find population one stars. Okay, so the answer is disc, bulge, halo. All right, so how do we see the spiral arms, right? Um, one of the, the problems is we can't see everything because there's dust that gets in the way, right? So I think um, that's a, this is a question that you wanna be able to answer. And here's, here's one of the people who answered that question, uh, Deborah Elmagreen, a uh, galactic astronomer. She, when we look up at the band of light, how are we supposed to see spirals there? What, do you see spirals? No, I just see a big band of light. But Deborah and her uh, colleagues who study galaxies know how to see the spiral arms. 
And the way that you see spiral arms, it turns out there's two ways to see spiral arms. So you want to write down the two ways. One of them is an indirect method, and it is called an O and B star association. So what are O and B? Well, you might remember from the mnemonic, O, B, A, fine girl, kiss me. What are the O and B stars? They are young, they are massive, and they are hot. Okay, these are young, massive stars. Now we know they're young because they're still alive, right? What are, one of the things that you wanna remember is O and B massive stars do not live very long. Remember a hundred solar masses is only a hundred thousand year lifetime on the main sequence. So if you see it, it is less than a hundred thousand years old, right? That's amazing, right? That's just a blink of a cosmological eye, right? It's just a tiny little amount of time. So when we see these stars, we know they're pretty fresh. They are newly born. So this is gonna be indirect, uh, indirect evidence, indirect evidence. They tend to be clustered in long strips. How do they form? And you know the answer. They form when a star explodes, when the shock wave, when the supernova explode of the star, the explosion of the star causes a shock wave that goes through the interstellar medium. And then you get strings of stars that form. Well, where do they form? They form on the edge of an interstellar medium, right? And in fact, it turns out these are gonna be part of the arms, on the edge of the arms of a galaxy. Okay, so we, you wanna write down something uh, for, for our uh, location. Uh, if, you, if somebody asks you, where do we live? Uh, you say Earth. Okay, and then where do you live? Around the, the star called Sol, eight kiloparsecs from the center of the galaxy. But if you wanted to name a little bit more, we have called this, this arm that we're on, it's called the Orion Cygnus arm. So you wanna know that. We live on the Orion Cygnus arm. There are some other arms as well. The Perseus arm, uh, the Carina Sagittarius arm, and the Scutum Centaurus arm. So what are the arms named for them? You know that. The constellations, their name for the constellations that we, we, we consider them to be between. So the um, Milky Way can be seen near Orion, going through the constellation of Orion and through the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. And so we give it that name, the Orion Cygnus arm. Uh, so what is the direct evidence? And this will be the last thing that we talk about today. Uh, what is the direct evidence for the arms of the Milky Way? And the answer is, it is made up of cold hydrogen gas. Does anybody remember H1 clouds, H1 regions? How do you see H1 regions? And the answer is, answer is radio astronomers look for the 21 centimeter arms, right? Okay, so we'll come back to this tomorrow. This is the part, 21 centimeter, okay. All right, I'm not gonna do that. Ah. So the way that you see, I'll just stop right now. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, uh, actually, I'm gonna write this down. Let's write it down. How do you see, how do you see the arms? Okay, so the indirect, indirectly through O and B stars, they're called associations. They are associated with the arms, okay? And then directly, <clears throat> this is a little secret, right? Because the 21 centimeter radio, uh, radio waves from the H1 regions. Because arms are mostly not stars yet, okay? So the idea is each of the arms, let me draw a little more structure, each of the arms of a galaxy is gonna have this region where you have H1, and then on the edge of that, you're gonna have stars, that have formed on the edge, but have not made it in to the core of that material yet, not yet, okay? 
So this is the O and B associations, and this is the arm itself, okay? The O and B associations are going to give us an outline, right? They're like an outline of the arm, okay? All right, so that's it for today. Thank you guys so much for being with me today. I hope you learned a little bit. And today I will give you a quiz based on the material that we covered. And we're gonna go ahead on um, Tuesday, we'll finish chapter 15 and then we will jump right into 16. I mean, it's really, we're almost done. I mean, we're like two thirds of the way through uh, chapter six, uh, 15, I'm getting a little confused. We, 15, chapter 15. So please, um, if you're an A student, you're reading chapter 15 already. And if you could be finished by Tuesday, then you will be right on target. Go ahead and start looking over the exams. That's the best way you can uh, prepare for the final. And later today, I will have uh, practice quizzes for you if you wanna practice that way, uh, the, the questions from exams one, two, and three. So thank you guys for being here. If you have any questions, I'll go ahead and answer questions right now in the YouTube chat. Okay, thank you guys so much. All right, see you later, bye. Hey, so if anybody has questions, uh, I'm here. Go ahead and type the questions in your chat. I'm happy to help you. You are awesome. <laughs> no, you. Thank you. Thank you guys for being here. At least I get a little feedback. I have a few people, a few regulars. Thank you guys for being here. I see names that I see all the time. Thank you. The rest of you guys who just watched the, the recording, it's much more fun to be here. Then you can interact with me. So, all right. So if nobody has any questions, I will go ahead and head off and get those questions ready for you uh, and look for that um, quiz later today. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, have a good day. Ah. Okay, thank you. Oh man, Whew. one day we'll go back to normal. I can't wait. I can see you guys all in person. You can come and visit me even though the class will be over. You don't have to, but I mean, I, you're always welcome. And my office door is always open. Um, so even if you're not my student, you, can, you are always my student and we, you know, you can come and visit me. I would love that, so. All right, now I'm gonna really stop the video. Thank you. <laughs>